Welcome to Lost Without Japan, a travel podcast about the life changing experiences of exploring Japan and those moments we would be lost without. For your listening pleasure, allow me to introduce your very own Kanko Gaido, Michael. Welcome to a special Lost Without Moments bonus interview episode. With our bi-weekly podcast being focused on Japan, your first visit, your next adventure, or just making Japan all around a better adventure for you, I have a special interview with a friend of mine who is also a huge fan of Japan and has visited a number of times himself. And he has the unofficial title of being the technical expert and meme researcher for the Deep in Japan podcast. And, you know, I get to borrow him today. So how can I say no? Uh, During today's interview, we're going to cover some Japan travel hacks and recommendations, as well as how you can find Japan in Canada. Because in reality, it's opening I'm really hoping it's opening. When this episode comes out, I hope there's even better news for that and that we can finally get past uh, James and I talking about how many times we can be fooled about Japan opening again. And not only is are we interviewing him, but we're actually celebrating together one year of podcast excellence with Lost uh, Without Japan and... I am so happy to have him here today. This is your Conco Gaido for TKIC Studio Productions coming to you with hopes and dreams of a return to travel in 2022 for all of you and then for my son and myself in summer 2023. I'd like to thank you all for giving me a bit of your time today. And I truly hope this podcast finds you on a great path or on the road to a better one, even if it may seem like it's a struggle at the moment. My belief is that we can all use a beacon like this one in our lives to guide us during these times, and my hope is that Japan, along with the show, will become that for you. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. If you're returning Lost Without Listener, thank you again for your time and returning once more. For today's show, let me introduce my friend and fellow Japan travel aficionado, James Hathaway. I must say I'm truly thankful for you setting aside multiple different times to meet with me and that we were able to figure it out today. So thanks for joining me, James. Hey, no problem. And uh, thanks for the warm welcome. And it's great with our audience members with this one year episode that I invited out to. Um, I can see Trevor and some others that are there. So it's pretty exciting having an audience right now. Awesome. James, with a Japan um Locked down right at the moment of recording, but maybe open way more for tourism in the foreseeable future. I feel that you and your Instagram account can provide a nice reminder that we can find Japan uh, even when we're outside of that. And y- your city especially is definitely that with everything you've been sharing. And I can't wait to share that with our audience members. But I'd like to visit Canada to begin with. But you offer way more than just the other half of the Niagara Falls and really the better half. Uh, maple syrup and ketchup flavored potato chips, my friend. You have a lot. <laughs> so I'm truly excited to have James come on and share some things that Canada offers and then also his own things about Japan. Here we go, my friend James. I'd like to always begin this portion of the interview with just you getting a chance to share a little bit about yourself. Uh, why you like me choose to go to Japan as often as you try as we've been trying to and mm-hmm. just you know anything you'd like to to start us off 
Sure. Um, I guess I'll start with, uh, I'm James Hathaway. I'm 43 years old. I was born in Toronto. I've lived in basically all over Canada. Um, I also have lived outside of Canada. I lived five years in the Caribbean, specifically the Cayman Islands. And now I call Vancouver BC home. So um, I've managed to travel, like I said, quite a bit all over the US, um, Asia, so mainland China, Taiwan, South Korea, and I've been to South Africa and Namibia and uh, Germany and uh, the UK. But specifically, I guess I have a soft spot in my heart for Japan, as, as, as I believe you too, you do as well, Mike. So, yeah. No, no doubt about it, my friend. And your passport is one to, you know, get framed, my friend. And I'm sure you're looking to have things open up and just even offer even more to us coming up. Yeah, I mean, this last couple of years has been rough. Um, I think the only international travel I've done is I did a day trip to Seattle and I had to go to uh, Phoenix for work for a couple of days. And that's like over the last three years. So I know some people have traveled a bit more, but but yeah, it's been it's been a little rough. Yeah. And before we get going too much uh, further, James, uh, I'd like to just share, if you don't mind, your um, like social media account. So if someone has... Sure. Questions about Canada or Japan or just wants to connect that they'd uh, be able to reach out to you? Sure. I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. Um, both are James underscore Hathaway, H-A-T-H-E-W-A-Y. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like craft beer. I like uh, coffee. I like hiking, mountains. I, I post a lot of pictures of my dog. And just the nature in general around here. Um just mostly stuff around Vancouver now, but once we start traveling again, you'll you'll definitely see Japan again in the near future. I I, I agree, my friend. I agree. Um, what are like we're gonna get into kind of like your Japan uh, backstory, your adventure, and things sure. like that. But like, what are some of your uh, like biggest Japan interests? Oh yeah, I mean the food, hiking, architecture. And uh, I'm just a massive nerd. So in my day job, I'm a software engineer. So I like uh, retro gaming. I like just kind of the whole electronic scene there. It's like James and I can uh, share back and forth when I had my uh, GameCube ready to go, <laughs> like modded to, to play with. It's nice to have somebody else to kind of geek out with uh, in our chat. So, <laughs> yep, for sure. Um, I think kind of from a very young age, I think this is a common story. I had a lot of hobbies that I didn't even realize were from Japan at the time. So uh, video games, I think a lot of people have that. And also when I was in high school, I had some pen pals that just happened to be from Japan. I guess I didn't pick Japan necessarily because it was Japan, but just that's how it sort of worked out. So yeah, I've been was talking back and forth with some people um, and then kind of the years rolled on and I still have contact with some of them, except instead of, you know, mail, physical mail, we use line now, but it's the same idea. <laughs> That's cool though, that you still have like, uh, you know, the relationships, contacts and things, uh, you know, from that, that just makes it nice to be able to meet somebody when you visit, um, uh, you know, yeah, for sure. it definitely changes the, the, the kind of the flavor of the trip when you get this, to meet some people. Awesome. Um, what, I know like with me uh, and probably we share a lot of things in common with this, but what is it that Japan has or did to you, you feel that when you visited made it something to where like me, we could go back probably on a pretty much yearly basis. Honestly, it's just a, it's a joy to visit. Um, I, I'm personally a big city guy, but also the small towns, um, the Anaka, um, all of it from you know top to bottom i have i have a lot of fun the food's great it's clean it's safe you know the culture is amazing the food, oh, i already said food but the food is great um, nature is awesome like i love the mountains yeah it's just it's super awesome <laughs> and, and the food is worth saying twice james <laughs> it really is it's, i mean it, it really definitely is. is like the <laughs> like i'm not saying it's impossible to have a bad meal there but i've never had a bad meal in japan so it's great and I, I love the fact like you can find things that aren't Japanese that they just do like really at times better than the country that it came from. And it's just everything is so fresh and their like study of whatever they're doing. If they're selling it like like a lot of time has went into this. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I, th- I think we were going to touch on this later, but I'll just say it now. One of the things I love about Japan is their kind of take on what they would consider foreign food. So, like, I've had some. There's a there's a restaurant on the top floor of the Yodabashi Camera in Akihabara called French Toast Factory, and it is amazing. Like, I don't know if you, if you could consider pancakes and, and French toast to be a, like a thing of art, but they've they've managed it. And then I've had some amazing Mexican food of all, in all places, uh, Harajuku, and just like it's not Mexican, but whatever it is, it's amazing. I like it's like when I was in Hiroshima, like walking along, and I found a place that had tacos. You know, it was tacos in a way, not really what you'd, you know, have for tacos. But again, same thing. It was just fantastic what it was like. It, they made it their own. And I I went back more than once. So that says all that you need to know for. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, I think we're going to ask you're going to ask me about food I miss later in the conversation. But I'm going to just say right out right from the top. I miss uh, the, the time of, uh Tamago Sandos, the, the egg, salad, egg salad sandwiches come from the convenience store. It's like one of the things I really miss. You can buy it here, but it's not the same. No, it's not. No, it's not. And, it, and it, all the food from the convenience store, for the most part, is just something to where, like, you're heading back. It's 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, whatever it is, o'clock in the morning. And you can go in and have something wonderful to eat. And that's just not the same for uh, here. No doubt about it. <laughs> not at all. Um James, I know your Japanese is uh, further along than mine, <laughs> like as I'm continually hopping back and forth from it. But could you tell me just a little bit about your kind of Japan language uh, adventure? Yeah, I mean, I, I would never claim to be skilled at Japanese, uh, but I did study it in college. Um, I did. I was actually in a speech contest at the Japanese embassy when I was 21 or 22. But yeah, unfortunately, as the years march on, I've kind of forgotten a lot of what I had learned. But it kind of comes back to me when, I, when I'm in Japan, like just being immersed in the environment kind of brings it back. But, but yeah, I mean, I guess like everyone, I have to admit, I need to study harder. And it's looking it's quite good about possibly spring 2023 for travel. So that'll give me a target to start practicing some of my, my basics again. Because, like, I was at a point um, before things shut down last summer, not like or the last last summer, whatever you want to do, summer 2021, um, I was going to be going with my son. And, man, I had my hiragana and katakana uh, down and I was beginning to get like some kanji and things. And I could look at menus online and I could sound things out, like try to figure it out. And I'm like, this is fantastic. And now I'm back to like brushing up on my hiragata <laughs> to kind of get the, the it is real like if we're if we're not using it it kind of uh gets replaced by whatever else is going on in your life uh the the list of kanji as they want you they i mean as, as most programs want you to learn it's not necessarily the order of things that you should be learning for travel like i would argue knowing like basic directions and like food items for menu reading is more important than some of the like university and school and I don't know, flower and this is a pen up We're and down about. and whatever that they, they want you to, I don't know. There's like a kind of prescribed li- uh, list or order that you're supposed to learn the characters, I guess eat probably by complexity, but I would argue that you should probably be learning some kind of practical stuff for, for like a traveler. I agree with you, my friend, and especially like with us and probably the people listening to the show, it's like well, they're they're looking to travel. It's not like a, uh, necessarily a business thing or, um, you know, other ones. It's definitely to get the most out of your travel. And I, I agree with that. Um, my show has probably heard me talk about my favorite memories, uh, some of them multiple, multiple times. Um, but I love uh, kind of like what I see, uh, like, you know, you've talked about in the past and what I have down here. Uh, could you just go ahead and uh, share some of your favorite travel memories uh, from your time in Japan? Sure. So I have a few. Um, one of them, this is going to, everyone's going to realize that I'm just a massive nerd for telling the story. But um, I, I, I play Magic the Gathering. So one of the things about Magic the Gathering is uh, there was a set called War of the Spark. Um, and that set had special art 
cards that were only available in Japan. And um, I'm just going to dig up this guy's name. So the artist was Yoshitaka Amano. So he did the art for an alternate art card for this card called Liliana. It's like, a, oh, oh, just making noises there. Doggos are allowed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so anyway, this, this there's a card called Liliana Dread Horde General that there's a special version of it only available in Japan. So that's like part one. And then more important, so so that was it. So I was trying to go around to various magic stores in Japan. This was during what they call pre-release. So I, I apologize in advance. I'm getting into the weeds here. But basically, the week before the set comes out, they do a pre-release. So you're supposed to be able to buy these pre-release kits and play. But of course, I was there on vacation, and I didn't realize that this was a thing, blah, blah, blah. So I was going around, and because everyone else knew that this special set of art cards were going to be in these packs everyone was sold out like sold out even before release you could not buy boxes so i was like oh that's kind of a bummer but i went to this store called tokyo mtg and they were like oh you know we can't sell you boxes but we can sell you and there's no space for you so you can't even play the pre-release but we'll sell you two pre-release boxes so each pre-release box has six packs and uh what they like a special promo card and so not only did i pull the liliana japanese alternate art card but i pulled the promo version of it with the with the date on it and that card was like they were they were trying to buy them off people for a hundred thousand yen, which is like a thousand bucks. And I'm like, ooh, it's like hit the lottery, <laughs> like nerd lottery. So that was pretty cool. I, I was pretty chuffed when that happened. And then the kind of another story. This is just kind of like being being a foreigner in Japan. These things happen. I was with my friends in Akihabara trying to buy some luggage, and. As I was coming out of the luggage store, these these people just came up to me and were like, hey, hey, do you like anime? I'm like, mm, yeah, uh, I like anime, but why? And he's like, oh, could you just sing us a song from your favorite anime? So I, the only thing I could think of off the top of my head was uh, Tonori no Totoro or My Neighbor Totoro. And there's a song that goes like, Aruko. Aruko, Watashi wa Genki. It's like, you know, I'm walking and I'm happy, whatever. And yeah, that they put that on TV, on Fuji TV. And it was and it was actually the secondary kind of moment or memory from that was trying to figure out what the show was and get a copy of it. So it was this show this show called Coco Cho, which is kind of uh Coco style. I'm not sure what Coco is supposed to mean. And it was on Fuji TV, 7 a.m. in 2018. And I was able to dig around in people's lists of TV shows. And I found, oh, like anime singing. And then it's like, oh, I found someone had posted a copy of YouTube. So that was kind of cool. That's even better. That's even better. I need to add, um, you know, actor uh, to your list of accolades as well, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> Um, I'm glad they were aggressive in their editing because when I went away from that encounter, I was thinking like, "Wow, I, I kind of seemed like kind of a like a fool." <laughs> but, but yeah, no, it was kind of it was fun, and I, I can send you a copy after if you want to see it. It's been pulled off YouTube, but I I would love I, it, my friend. <laughs> sure, I'd love it. I will. I have no shame. I'll send it to you. No problem. Um, I, uh, I'm also part of that Magic the Gathering, uh, you know, pre-release things. Nothing as cool as you for your cards, but, uh, you know, it's, mine's the Warhammer store that I hit in Tokyo, um, when I was there last. So, you know, it's, you're, you're in good company, my friend. Um, so, so we can pull, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to throw in one more thing. The thing I find interesting is that these, there's like a, there's a store for any sub-community in Japan. What I mean by that is the first couple of times I went, I was more into retro gaming. And somehow I went around Akihabara and missed all of the Magic the Gathering stores. They were, I'm not, I don't want to say hidden, but if you don't know what to look for, you just kind of like walk by them. It's like, oh, yeah, I made cafe. Oh, blah, 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 blah. One of those stores is literally like, it's called how to, you know, how to, how to, you, how to, oh my God, I have to look at what it's pronounced. It's like Hello Yuya, but in Katakana. Anyway, it's literally five floors, and it's like Pokemon 
Magic the Gathering and other TCG games, and somehow I just no idea it was there. So it's, so it's amazing get, how they get hidden. No, and it's easy to get lost, like, or only look at what's on the, the ground floor and not pay attention yeah. to what's above, and you really can miss out. Uh, like when so, I was sorry, the, the store's called Hallelujah. If, you, if you're ever in Tokyo, Hallelujah is, or Tokyo MTG are the places you want to go to check out Magic the Gathering. Those are kind of the bigger stores, yeah. Um, you've shared some of yours, uh, things that you have, but what are some of your uh, go-to places to visit that would be outside of that Osaka, Tokyo, Kyoto, uh, you know, main things that if like someone was coming for the first time and they have just a couple of days to visit, they're going to hit? Sure. Um, I got a whole list. Um, I think this one is fairly well known, but I think Kamakura is a great place to go. Um, it's close to Tokyo. Uh, most people know the Daibutsu, which is the large, uh, there's a large, probably the largest, at least in Japan, uh, Buddha statue. But also there's, uh, this one may not be as well known. There's hiking, what they call hiking courses that goes all through the city from the Daibutsu to other temples and then to the seaside. It was pretty neat. Um, another place I like is, uh, it's actually near Mount Fuji. It's called uh, Kawaguchiko. So Kawaguchiko has an amazing view of Mount Fuji. Um, you take the Fuji Kyokyu, Kyokyu, hold on, I have to look at the name of this train. It is the Fuji Q train line. And that will take you, yeah, to Kawaguchi Go. And it's just, it's part of, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but there's a bunch of lakes. And you can take a cable car up what they call Kachikachi Mountain. And then you have a really awesome view. So then just rolling down my list, uh, Hiroshima. Um, I mean, people know the history behind Hiroshima. And that's, an, you know, there's some great sites and museums to see. But I will throw out there that they're, the Hiroshima-style okonomiyaki is the best. I'm sorry, my Kansai brothers, but noodles make it, make the dish. It is so good. It's so amazing. And also, if you can see a carps game, you you definitely should because it is so fun. And then just kind of like finishing it off um, in Ibiraki, we went to a place called Hitachi Seaside Park, and they just have side of I don't know, it's just a big hill, I guess, and they just thousands and thousands and thousands of flowers. When we were there, they were all blue, but I guess it's seasonal depending on when you go. It's just uh, yeah, it's amazing. My wife loved it. So yeah, there we go. That's just a list. I like it, and then I saw like for for you too. Uh... One of my favorite places was the uh, um, Yokohama Ramen Museum. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Yokohama. Great town. Ramen Museum is awesome. Yeah. There's just so many great restaurants down there. And it's not as as crazy as Tokyo for, for, for how busy it is. And that fact that you can get those like little sample servings of the dish so that you can actually eat a bunch of different things is huge. I didn't see that to start. And I ate like a regular you know size bowl and then someone pointed out there was you know with one of my friends pointed out said hey you can get samples and i was like oh yes i can eat so much more now it's beautiful <laughs> yeah that's definitely the um the the pro choice or the pro move you want to be getting the sample dishes because otherwise after two you're done and then i know i had said um like kind of like uh, steered you away from uh tokyo osaka and kyoto but it's not fair to not let you uh, share some favorite places within um, those cities because they are wonderful. Um, what would you like to share uh, among that, my friend? I'm going to drop a few. Um, Takada no Baba is a great neighborhood that most people don't get a chance to hit up. Um, that is the area where Astro Boy or Tetsuya no Adam, as it's known in Japanese, the, uh, the mangaka or the original artist of the manga of Astro Boy was, I guess, from there. And as soon as you come out of the station, there's a huge mural that is just like dedicated to him, his art. So I think it's pretty cool. And also it's just that the area has a lot of awesome pubs and it's not, it's kind of off the beaten path a little bit. I think, I mean, I know it's on the, it's on the Yamanote line, so it's not really off the beaten path, but I think most tourists don't go there. So it's kind of fun. Another area I liked was Ikibukuro. Um, I think... If anything, people might be going there because the Pokemon Center is there at Sunshine City, but um, there's some really cool restaurants and pubs there. I, I like a place called Two Fingers. 
uh, I'm kind of like into craft beer, so I like that place. And then kind of the final one I want to throw out there, um, if you are into retro arcade games at all, especially like shmups from the 90s or even 80s, so I'm talking like Konami games, R-Type, Darius, Gradius, you know, Cave, Treasure Shooters, uh, Bullet Hell, all this stuff, Kato, Kato Hei in Akihabara, amazing. It's a, it's different than almost every other game center that you might be used to, you know, with UFO. Well, actually, they, they might have UFO catchers on the bottom, but whatever. Most game centers are set up in a very formulaic way. And Tato Hay is a little different because they have a floor dedicated to old retro arcade games. And I, like I spent easily four hours, five hours there. Just my wife's like, hey, are you done? I'm like, no. So, so I don't know. Like I, I I'm a, I'm a certain type of of nerd, and that's just the stuff I like. And you, you are correct, though, in that Japan has something for um, everybody. It really does, and it's just every time I go, I find something new. Like the last time I went, it was not that I hadn't had pork cutlets and curry and all like the katsudon before, but man, I went out of my way to discover anything that wasn't a chain last time. And every time I came across the place that was not a chain, I sat and ate, which had me have five uh, pork katsudon with curry uh, meals in one day, which, you know, luckily I was walking a lot. That's all I got to say. Yeah, it's it's amazing, too, how each place has a slightly different take on what you might consider to be a classic dish. Like, um, I don't know, tonkatsu kare. Like, there's just so many pl- ways you can do that. Or even something as simple as um, omu raisu, like the omelet rice. There's just so, so many different unique takes that I've had while I was there. You and I are both chomping at the bit. Uh, we constantly are looking at how much the yen is worth. Um, you know, I was we were just talking about flight prices. We've been talking about how um, it's looking like there's tour companies right now to where you can basically give them a couple hundred bucks and they'll let you just use whatever your itinerary that you want to to get yourself in. So things are looking wonderful. Um, you know, and he, James, let me tell you, is a man that is on the pulse uh, when it comes to those things. And I have to I have to admit freely that most of what I have that I don't see coming across news feeds of my own is directly uh, coming from him. So <laughs> it's like it's good. It's good. Uh, good things. It's but here. So it's interesting you brought that up. Just so, I mean, we can stake ourselves here. We're September 14th right now. Japan is open in theory, except you need to have a, a tour group or tour company basically bless your trip. And like uh, Mike, you were saying, there are companies out there that will, instead of having a prepackaged tour, kind of just rubber stamp your own plan. So that's where we are now. Yeah. And find your Reddit, my friends, because it is, um, you know, out there. Both you and I can't wait, can't wait to get there. And I have an idea of what I want to eat when I get there, when things open back up. What is it for you, my friend? What are you jonesing for the most? Honestly, the Tamago Sando. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause some controversy here. The obvious choice is from Family Mart. So that's what I'm chomping at the bit for. Otherwise, uh, uh, Hiroshima-style okonomiyaki. For whatever reason, I cannot get it here in, in Canada. Like, I, there's a few places that will do okonomiyaki, but it is Osaka style. So it's just not quite the same. I'm going to have to, um, like when we get, like we're, like we said, we're going to both share uh, coming out towards each other, but there is a place that's up in Chicago um, that had it last. I was, it was there, my friend. So um, that awesome. could be something to hit. So uh, what are some of the favorite foods or places? I know we've talked about some of this already um, in here, but just some of the other foods, meals, snacks, and such that uh, you love about uh, Japan that maybe we haven't covered at this point. Sure. So um, I'm going to kind of zoom past the the stuff that most people would would uh, expect, because I think I think it's a given that ramen, you know, miso ramen or um, I don't know, like uh, shabby shabby or something. But I'm I, <sighs> one thing I kind of miss is uh, just crepes in Harajuku. This so is just like on the go wrapped up i think i I mentioned uh foreign food interpretations like french toast factory um the mexican place i went to in harajuku and also in i don't know if it's still there or not but in shimo kitazawa there was a place that actually made canadian style putins so that's french fries with gravy and cheese 
And I thought that was wild because I, I don't want to hurt their feelings, but it, it really wasn't a Putin. But it was something different and special because they put um, so karage on fries. <laughs> Okay, so if you can imagine that, gravy and cheese and karage, uh, Japanese poutine. I'll throw, it, I'll throw out one last one. So there's a mountain near Tokyo called Takao. It's, uh, it's a really nice place to go hiking. And um, I went to a place called Gonsuke. So Gonsuke near Takao-san, which is near Tokyo. And it was just the most kind of magical experience I'd had f- that trip basically so a friend of mine one of my like longtime friends booked it for me for us like we all went and it was a really intimate setting and you had your own little private room and it was uh grilled seafood so like they have charcoal and you have like a like a metal grill and they just bring you out seafood and veggies and yeah you just kind of fry it in front of you on these on these coals and it was just so tasty and uh you know, sake and beer and uh, what a magical experience. And then uh, my, my wife is vegetarian. So as usual, oh, I don't know if we, we want to get into this later on, but uh, as usual, they didn't quite know what to do with her at first. But then it's like, oh, we'll just give you these three giant bowls of like, you know, lettuce and tofu and bamboo shoots and mushrooms and and Sherry's like, my wife is like, oh, I don't know if I can eat all that. It's like, here, there's more vegetables. Eat this. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yes, Gonsuke. It's really good. Um, I can, I don't know if you have show notes, but I can try to get you the, the link to the location so that people can check it out. For sure. I'd, I'd love to include it with that. And cool. Um, I know I was looking through your favorite activities in Japan and see that we share in some uh, for sure, because one of the things I enjoy doing the most is that kind of uh, spontaneous exploration. Um, mm. So why don't you share some of yours? Sure. So um, you touched on that uh, first. So I'll say spontaneous exploration. Um, the reason I like it is like basically um, Japan is completely safe. Like I know it's like with an asterisk, but like, I mean, we've both, we've both been to Chicago. We, we know what, safe and not safe can be so i would argue that it's totally safe i've been to some rough parts of osaka and you know rough and rough there's two different things so yeah um i feel completely safe get off any station random station just walk around you see so much cool stuff little looking down little side streets especially especially in tokyo but not only in tokyo but just there's so much stuff hidden everywhere Places that you would, like, from North America would consider to have a restaurant or stores, whatever, yes, they will have it tucked away in little hidden spots. So it's just, it's so fun just to walk around. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I love hiking. And uh, I love just digging around for stuff I'm missing. Like, I collect retro games. I think I mentioned that already. So I'm always trying to seek out stuff. Um just to throw it out there, the kind of the secret is there's some bigger stores that everyone knows about, especially in Akihabara. Those ones tend to have more stuff and be more expensive. So you also want to try to hunt around in other neighborhoods. With uh, the hiking things, I, I have a interview that I'm going to be coming up with because I had a um, author that I'm going to be looking to interview in October that's done a lot of hiking herself. And that's something that I need to add to my list that and like a nice uh, bike ride, just get out of uh, whatever I can get out of. Cause really that's some of my happiest and most memorable th- times have just been those experience itself. So, you, you know, you're selling to me on it, my friend. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's just so much hiking you can do. I have, uh, um, I can give you some links. There's books about doing like multi-day hikes and day hikes and not just, around Tokyo, like in all, all, all over Japan. So there's, there's a lot of things you could do. I like it. And then um, you have a list that I know um, of places that we're looking to visit um, when things open back up that, you know, you mm-hmm. haven't visited yet. I'm on that and I share um, all of those that you have listed <laughs> right now as places that I want to go to. So uh, what are you looking to hit back up when things open up? Um, well, first of all, Hokkaido. I have never been to Hokkaido. Um, I've heard a lot of really cool things about it. The food scene's supposed to be amazing and nature is, is awesome. And if I go in the winter, I like to go snowboarding. Um, there, so, 
between Nagano and Hokkaido, that's kind of where the best resorts are, as far as I'm aware. So yeah, there's that. And then Fukuoka, uh, I've heard good things about. I've never been that far west. And I have been to Nagano, but I've never left Nagano City or wherever the, the Shinkansen stops at. So I'd like to explore Nagano more. There's a lot of stuff to see there, and I've basically not seen any of it. And James, you're, you're selling things for me a, a little bit too, because Gifu, uh, the city of Gifu, that is, is one of the things that's going to be coming up for a talk for the show. Um, awesome. As it is, like, as it is with all these interviews and stuff right now, it's going to be pushed back a bit. But um, I love, like, there's so much around there that you just don't even realize. Can offer so much with those places that you're going. Um, are there any activities that you're looking to do in Japan that you have not gotten a uh, chance to yet? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I got a laundry list. Uh, I have never hiked Mount Fuji. Um, that one is a little bit of a uh, planning exercise and you're at the mercy of what the weather, but I would love to do it someday, even though people always say, um, it's Mount Fuji is kind of prettier to see from the distance than to actually hike it. But anyway, it's on my list. Um, I like to maybe go snowboarding. I think I mentioned that already in, in, in Japan. Uh, if you want to talk long-term goal, there is a uh, Shikoku Island has an 88 temple hike. It's uh, it's like a big kind of milestone thing, kind of like hiking the Appalachian trail in the U S it's it's quite far. It's twelve hundred kilometers. Most people do it over six weeks. Um, some people will actually just uh, drive it or bus it instead of doing the hike. But I think the hike would be cool if I can actually take that much time off work or take a sabbatical or something. But anyway, I guess finally, um, I'd love to try to play Magic: The Gathering in Japanese in Japan. I think that would be awesome. So that's kind of a, a goal. Learn enough of the terms. Uh, actually, the terms are not that complicated i think it's achievable so you know, yeah. we're gonna have our own uh self-publicized uh attorney as well you know just uh, all of us meet up together you i jeff and stuff and have our own little uh, uh magic the gathering tournament as well so it, it, it'll be good times had by all yeah it's the uh the first annual tatishina invitational <laughs> that's it could have t-shirts made t-shirts my friend that's where it, that's where it all comes in <laughs> yeah for sure um I wanted to um, ask, like, you have a lot of knowledge about Japan. What is a kind of travel hack that you would offer someone for Japan at the moment? Sure. So I got a couple things. Um, I think the number one absolute most important travel hack I have for you is if you're thinking of going to Japan, now's the time to buy yen. So, I mean, really, one US dollar is 144. Um, when I was uh, last in Japan, I think I paid 107. That is a huge difference. Uh, the, the prices of stuff will seem really cheap, and I'm a little afraid when the when everything opens up and people start traveling. Probably, I don't know if it's going to go back to 105, 108, but it might go back to 120. So I'll tell you, when I bought my first, I bought some yen at 123, and I thought that was a screaming deal that would never get better. And here we are at 140. So. That's kind of my first suggestion. And another one, this one's not really a hack per se, but um, I, I guess my first trip, I stayed in a neighborhood because I thought it would be hopping with nightlife, uh, Akihabara. And it turns out that nerds go to bed. Yes, early, we, yes we do. <laughs> just, not, just nothing was open. So I would come back from hiking at, at 9, 30, 10 p.m. And the only thing that opened was the Korean ramen shops. And it's like... But if you stay in a place like Shinjuku or Ikibukuro or Shibuya, then you've got restaurants open basically 24 hours. You can have meat on sticks. You can have noodles, udon, you know, whatever, whatever. So I think I already mentioned that if you're into like buying, collecting retro stuff or figurines or any of this kind of nerdy stuff, finding shops that are off the beaten path will get you less supply but cheaper prices because everybody knows to go to Akihabara. Everybody knows about Super Potato. Blah, 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 blah. And also, I would mention there are stores they call recycle shops in Japan. Uh, Book Off, Hard Off, these are great places for finding nerdy stuff like uh, uh, DVDs, uh, CDs, used video games. And they do have a lot of retro stuff, like if you're wanting like a Super Famicom or 
um, like a GameCube or a Nintendo 64 or games or controllers or stuff like that, they usually have a pretty good selection. And and you can find some things that look like they've never been touched before, and that's like uh, yeah. so much fun as it's you know <laughs> as yeah, well. So it's kind of there's there's kind of two sides to it. There's two possibilities: either it's never been touched and it's never been abused, or the thing was in a in a hot box with like ten people smoking, and the thing's yellow and it smells like <laughs> death. It's one of the <laughs> others. Like there's no there's nothing in between. That's so true. So true. So at this point, uh, James, and we can add some more later on, but. One of the reasons I wanted to bring you on was to talk about Canada because you post a whole bunch of things that make me super jealous on a regular basis for like things that you have access to. I thought I had a good amount of things. Um, you're putting me to shame. So I'd like to kind of uh, transition over into sure. what seems to be a never ending amount of restaurants that uh, Canada offers. Uh, what are some of your favorites? Uh, sure. So when you say Canada, I think you really mean the greater Vancouver area. So you I'm going to touch on believe. that in a bit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I, I was just going to try to flip it a bit, maybe explain why first and then get into the list. Yeah. So what's interesting about the greater Vancouver area and we kind of punched above our weight is because of the demographics. So in all of the greater Vancouver area, 51% of people are from either Southeast or East Asia. So that's Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Indian, etc. And in Burnaby, where I live, oh wait, sorry, 51% was Burnaby, 69% in Richmond, 42% for all of Vancouver. So what that means is a very high concentration of Asian restaurants. So Japanese, Korean, Chinese. And the thing that's kind of awesome is it's not just like Japanese or Chinese. It's like, oh, did you want Hainan food? Did you want um, Kunan food? Did you want uh, Cantonese food? Did you want Shanghai style? Did you want Beijing style? Did you want Xinjiang style? Did you want Sichuan style? So that kind of also, to a lesser degree, is available for other countries like Korean and Japanese. So it's just, it's amazing. Um, I will preface that, yes, I've had amazing Japanese food in New York City and, you know, other parts of, of, of North America. But I will argue we punch above our weight because New York City has, what, like 10 or 15 million people? And we have, like, three. So, yeah. But, yeah, sorry, you were mentioned, you wanted me to give suggestions um, or some, some like, highlights. Um, we have so many nice sushi places. Uh, it's kind of hard to list them all. But just as a special, like some some more specialized places, there's a, a restaurant called Gyo, which has really nice uh, bukake udon. And this is one that some people may have their heads in the gutter, but it is just amazing Japanese, like it's amazing food that I've is kind of hard to find. Um, another place that was really good is called Zakushi. So this is kind of like a sub, like an izakaya. So it's uh, typical meat on sticks. Um, chicken and beef and whatever with, uh, you know, amazing miso glazes, yuz yuzu glazes um, and other stuff like akadashi mochi and just all kinds of stuff. And it's kind of nice because the thing that, I mean, I don't know, know if it really matters, but they import charcoal from Japan. So it's just that's the trying for the whole experience. And I can try to send you some pictures. Well, I don't know if you have a way to put pictures in your show notes, but it is a really nice restaurant. And then there's just the ramen scene here is off the hook. Um, I don't even know if I was aware of the difference between a Fukuoka and Hokkaido styles of ramen, but both are represented here. Um, there's actually quite a, there's a few Hokkaido style ones around here. Um, I'm trying to think what else. And apparently this, this one is disputed according to Wikipedia, but apparently the inventor of the California roll has a restaurant here. So it's called Tojo covers a bunch of bases and then like you you said there's a lot of things uh even outside of that but i, I man I, james it's like not being able to get in japan itself like i found places around me that i didn't know even exist and i would have vis visited you uh regardless even if it's just a geek out over some retro gaming or uh, magic the gathering but having all of this here uh you know i can post some uh instagram pictures and make it look like i'm out of the country when i am out of the country just not the country they think I'm out of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll throw in one more. There's a place here called Japa Dog that's pretty good. And it's uh, 
a Japanese guy opened a restaurant and it's literally Japanese style toppings on on hot dogs. It's kind of really cool. Um, if you look at the menu, you can see that they have um, yaki niku and yaki soba on hot dogs, uh, chicken karage, uh, yaki niku. Anyway. I'll say, we can put that in the show notes as well. It's an interesting place. I'll be happy to include uh, anything and everything you want, my friend. Um, sure. Do you have, um, like, like, there's different things that are going on. Um, are there any uh, festivals uh, or anything like that that's taking place uh, in your area? Yes, there is two. Um, there's a Powell Street Matsudi, and the second one is called the Nikkei. That's it in Burnaby. So I have not been to either, but I can send information about them. Awesome. Um, like anytime you can get anything, I think it's huge. And like I plan yep. on going next summer. Um, I plan on going the following summer if things, you know, are just where they're open to make up for lost time. So like summer 2023, summer 2024. But then I probably will have to take a break because um, my daughter and I will be planning um, her trip, and mm. I'm going to have to save uh, to be able to pay for two people to go. Uh, so I will uh, have to kind of take a step back as hard as that will be for me to do. It's going to be worth it uh, to share in that with her because, I mean, like, you, you want those important people in your life to share in those things that mean the most to you, and Japan is, like, one of those for me. And for sure. um, I think, you know, maybe the trip to Vancouver will have to happen for a, a, another time, like a second time, uh, you know, at that point in time, just so I can get that fix of great food and, <laughs> you know, like uh, go on from there too. Um, do you ever see uh, with your love of Japan, um, like making that move to where you're like, you know what, Japan's going to be me full time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could never say never, but right now I feel like I've got too much roots here in Canada. Like my wife's parents are living in Vancouver. That's part of the reason why we came back from the Caribbean. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. And I mean, I got a pretty good thing going on as well for my job. I, I'm doing work for a company in Phoenix. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Never, never can say never. But what I would love if I could, if I can angle myself into some kind of work that needed me to be in japan a few times a year that's probably more realistic but you know you never know that's like me trying to figure out the whole tour guide thing my friend where like every summer june july i could just be there and tour guide around my own sightseeing and have some of that cost uh you know of of the trip be offset by you know making some back while you're there that's like it wouldn't be a bad thing <laughs> yeah i um, mean there are people that do that go for a season it's not impossible for us as we, you know, hopefully this uh, wait, this void that we've been experiencing for Japan to reopen is is actually coming to an end. Um, but what are some things that you do to help fill fill that void? Besides, you know, uh, chatting with me and <laughs> you know, in in our uh, deep in Japan chat. Yeah, I mean, I find, I mean, this is not going to sound super enlightening or anything but i just try to keep on top of 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 the feed kind of the the gaijin twitter feed what, what's what's coming i follow quite a few people that are in japan and just trying to keep track of you know how how their life is going and just i try to keep track of the news as well so just serious what's then funny like both just trying to keep a feel of what's going on I wanted to uh, give like you have so much to offer, my friend. I feel like we could talk for um, multiple hours just about all the different parts of uh, Japan or things that you're you know knowledgeable about. But um, like w without, I mean, we talked for like what was it with Jeff like uh, two and a half hours, and we really didn't talk about much. Like <laughs> it's like so uh, you know. I, I do sure. Feel. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it happens. Yeah. There, there, there's just a lot, lot to talk about. It's just as long as you have a topic, we can just go on for hours. If you want to talk about, you know, whiskey tasting near Kyoto, you want to talk about craft beer in Tokyo, you want to talk about searching for nerd stuff, yeah, <laughs> or just hiking in the woods. To have you back on, my friend, because like lots of those are things I think uh, people would like to be able to hear about. And I said, but I don't sure. want to. You know, take up too much of the night. Like I said, I appreciate you coming on to celebrate the year. Um, I appreciate the uh, audience that has come to listen in today. 
And um, I just wanted before we like start going to set up, you know, probably talks of having you back on again for for different things. But what are some uh, of your favorite like movies, books, uh, anime or such that you might want to recommend to each other or recommend to (laughs) you do recommend to me, but recommend to others? (laughs) Sure. Um, the one thing I'm going to recommend is uh, this is a really old manga and anime that's having a remake. So Urese Yasuda, it is uh, Rimiko Takahashi's first manga, if I remember right. Um, it's, you know, it's got a lot of history. I'm sure most people are aware of at least the characters Lum and Ataru and, you know, the whole like ogre and she can and, and, she, and he's always womanizing and he and she shocks him and but kind of all of that story behind it. So yeah, um, I think it's November that there's going to be a new Uritsu Yatsura show. We might need to do a viewing party at that that time, my friend, just as that drops. Yeah, we that's should. On a, <laughs> I think like, you can I, do that on Disc- Discord, right? Yes, yes, yes. I like it. Um, October 2022. So it's coming, coming soon. I like it. That is my um, recommendation. October. Watch <laughs> the new Uritsu Yatsura. We'll all be there. We'll be all. Be there. <laughs> so, um, what is like? I'm doing some research as well. Like I said, I, man, I found some things for my son and I, like for baseball games, and then I'm looking to um, head out to at least one city, Fukuoka, that I've not been before with him. What are some things that you're currently researching? So, like, hey, it opens back up, I can go. Where's that research taking you, my friend? Right now, snowboarding locations, resorts, um, places to stay near them if I need to rent a car or not, things like that. And also like just hiking locations. That's kind of what's keeping me busy. On top of that, I'm trying to think there was something else. Um, oh, depending on when I go, I've always wanted to go to a thing called Komi Cat. Um, I might've said it wrong. Like, yeah, it is Komi Cat. Komi Keto. Um, I wanted to go when I was there in 2019, but I had managed to miss the time frame that it was uh that it was running so so yeah um it's really busy it's um i i've heard the you know getting in can be challenging um but yeah that's kind of it would be cool i think to go once what are some of your favorite like uh either podcasts youtube shows just anything that you kind of do to absorb japan sure i got a few for podcasts, uh, I think you alluded to it already, but Deep in Japan is ran by uh, a gentleman named Jeff Kruger who lives in Nagano. It's a great podcast. Uh, he has kind of two flavors of podcasts. One is um, he'll do like serious interviews where he'll find people and, you know, interview them about some par- aspect of Japanese culture or he has a kind of a happy hour. I can't remember what he calls it now, like after dark or something, where it's just, it's just you know, it's a little bit more uh, informal about life in Japan. A couple more. Um, there's a podcast called Disrupting Japan by Tim Romero. This is kind of more businessy. He's talking about startup life in Japan. So that's kind of cool. And there's another one called Voices in Japan. don't know their surnames, but it's Ben and Burke. And this is kind of more general life in Japan. It's quite interesting. So these guys live in uh, Hokkaido. So it's kind of neat to hear how life is going in Sapporo. And then on on the uh, YouTube front, I'll recommend one. Uh, it's called Critical Eats Japan. They're just going around eating at different fast food places. He did a whole bunch of like sit down Japanese or sorry, um, burger places, like r- ranking them. And then I see like, oh, he went to Moss Burger. Oh, he's like at uh, McDonald's when they have the new set or whatever. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good. I like it, buddy. Um, is there anything that you'd like to uh, say or share um, that maybe we didn't cover to this point? If you can manage it, definitely try to get some yen. Because I think next year, not I won't say too late, but you will be pay- I think you'll be paying more. Um, other than that, yeah, just keep your eyes on... Um, on Twitter or Reddit, because I think ne- in the next week or so, we're going to hear the news that travel is open again, and then the floodgates will be open. Can't wait. I really can't, my friend. And I think you're 100% correct. You get around springtime of next year, and that yen is going to be a different direction than it is right now. So totally worth it. If someone wants to get in contact with you, either um, for things that are near you, 
or maybe about hiking or other things like that, um, where could listeners of the show uh, reach out to uh, talk to you? Probably easiest on Twitter, um, James underscore Hathaway. Um, I mean, you can follow me on Instagram as well. Excellent. Uh, thank you again, James, for uh, joining us today. I truly appreciate you setting aside the time for me, my friend. Yeah, no problem. It was uh, it was great. Thanks for having me. Thank you, my friend. And on behalf of Lost Without Japan and the entire crew, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our interview. And I truly look forward to having you on board again for our next regularly scheduled episode as we continue our discussion on Japan, travel, culture, and your Lost Without moments. To everyone out there, oh, ginky day. Stay well, my friends.